welcome to uh, back to the stage, uh, uh, David Rue, uh, the, for the for the third time today, and super super excited to have you uh, here. And thank you for for joining us. David uh, was a keynote speaker with a wonderful fireside chat that we recorded, and we're going to share with you with the entire community. If you haven't had a chance to to see it, it was it was really delightful to to have. Uh, David and hear us about some of uh, his history and that led him to where he is today, okay. which is very, very interesting. Uh, but also learn about the work that he's doing in Microsoft today, uh, which obviously, you know, as while he was joining Microsoft, all of a sudden, all the eyes are on, on health and, and, and how, how amazing it is that uh, their chief medical officer is uh, an infectious disease specialist. Uh, mm -hmm. so, so really like, uh, you know, timely, uh, the right person at the right time. And, and here we have the, you know, we have Olivier Olivier. Uh, talking with us as well, and uh, a sign of times. Uh, interesting. Yeah, good to see you, Olivier. Excellent. Okay. A little bit higher. A little bit higher. Yes, that's great. Peter Yellowlees is on the line as well. Is this correct, Peter? I saw you for a second, but now I think that you're off camera. So if you can turn your camera on, that will be wonderful. And we have uh, Nina Vassan, Dr. Nina Vassan, uh, joining us from. Uh, from uh, uh, from Stanford, uh, and uh, we have Doctor Doctor Ulia. Uh, we have uh, here Doctor Sudev Dalai, also from Stanford. Inf another infectious disease specialist who's joining us uh, to this panel. I just want to wait uh, for a second for Peter uh, Yellowlis, and this is the you know the back to work uh, uh, panel. You know, like I, I told David that. Uh, this morning, I, I decided to shave uh, of the kind of like, uh, oh, look, Olivier still has the scruff, right? So he's, he's still uh, he's still more more uh, fashionable than I am. But I decided that it's uh, enough to, with quarantine and smart time to, to start going back to judiciously and uh, smartly and wisely. But it's enough. It's time to uh, start going back to, to doing things. And uh, I shave. So uh, feeling really good about that. And uh, so we have in the panel uh, uh, David Rue, as I mentioned, the chief uh, medical officer uh, of, of Microsoft. We have uh, Dr. Uh, Nina Vassan, uh, the founder, founder and executive director of uh, Brainstorm, the Stanford Lab for Mental Health Innovation, uh, the world's first uh, academic laboratory dedicated to transforming mental health through entrepreneurship and technology. Uh, she served on the on Barack Obama's Health Policy Advisory Committee and worked at the World Health uh, Organization in Geneva in the office of the Director General, uh, Dr. Margaret Chan. Uh, she received an MD from Harvard uh, and, uh, and completed uh, working at Stanford now, so it's underachiever. Uh, she's, uh, and there's, I can continue on and on. Uh, and then we have a, 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 a very recent addition to our, uh, to our, uh, uh, to our panel here. Uh, we have Sweb Sudeb here. Uh, that will uh, introduce himself for, in just uh, one second. But Sudeb is at Stanford as well, uh, infectious disease specialist and doing a lot of work recently. Uh, obviously, a lot on his plate since the pandemic started. Uh, and uh, and Olivier, Olivier Olier, who I, I actually know from the World Economic Forum when he was actually managing the global practice and, and healthcare there. And, uh, and he's the president of Emotive the global leader in personalized uh, neuroinformatics. He's a former head of strategy, global health and healthcare, and a member of the executive committee of the World Economic Forum. And we had Vanessa uh, here before, who used to run the global healthcare practice, uh, running uh, the previous panel that David was uh, was on. So we have a World Economic Forum uh, connection here. Uh, he's a full-time professor of behavioral and brain sciences at uh, Mix Marseille University. Uh, and he taught at the universities of Oxford and, and Geneva uh, as well. So uh, really delighted to have uh, all of you here on the Back to Work uh, panel. Uh, we, I hope that you have Peter Yellowlis uh, joining us back and I'll introduce him uh, when he joins. Uh, but uh, let, let's, start to, uh, uh, let's start with, uh, with a, a real Back to Work uh, solution uh, that will affect a lot of people's lives. Because I know that like, here's something that didn't exist before the pandemic. Uh, with a technology company that uh, that is working in certain areas, and and now all of a sudden shifting their focus on something that just did not exist three months ago, to helping all of us return back to not only shave but actually go back to work. 
right? So David, tell us a little bit about some of the work that you guys are doing. Yeah, thank you, Ron. Uh, this was a project that was initiated by United Health Group, uh, one of the largest payers in the United States and, and also globally. They uh, had been thinking a large part about uh, what could they do to lean in to help with regards to this uh, next stage of uh, bringing businesses back online uh, and enabling it to do it in a safe manner. Uh, they have, uh, because of their ability to um, connect all the dots within the healthcare system from providers to lab tech, tech you know, lab companies, uh, was, was able to create a, a nice streamlined workflow uh, that would allow an individual to be able to um, basically use an app to self-attest whether or not they had certain symptoms and were ready to go to work. Uh, allow the scanning of an, an employer to scan that uh, individual uh, using their smartphone as the, you know, like a QR code on the smartphone is, is the entry pass. And then for those that actually had symptoms to be able to then um, get an immediate evaluation in, in, in an expedited, expedited manner, uh, get a lab test uh, to essentially determine if they have the infection or not. And clearly uh, that could then trigger a series of other actions if the individual um, were infected. But what it did is it empowered businesses uh, to be able to do this uh, approach on a regular basis. And on May 6th, uh, the CDC put forward some interim guidance on employee uh, on businesses to help guide them in the path. And uh, first on the list was daily symptom checking to assess to see whether or not the employees are safe to enter a facility. Uh, so what we're recognizing is that uh, while there are so many different ways that we can try to assess, uh, we don't have tests, unfortunately, for every single person. Um, we're gonna have to prioritize and clearly the ones who are symptomatic, uh, healthcare workers and frontline workers uh, tend to uh, be the ones who we'd want to uh, be the ones to receive the test first. Uh, and this is in line with that. Uh, this program was launched uh, just a, about a week ago, uh, it is open to all businesses, small, medium, and large. They don't even have to be United Health uh, companies uh, or uh, members, um, and it's really designed to try to address some of the the primary concerns of, you know, enabling an efficient uh, triage process, screening and triage, but then also connecting it to the labs. Yep, that's that's awesome. So, so really practical approach to to really getting people uh, back to work at large scale. And, and, you know, we're talking about, you know, managing risk. We're talking about, you know, making it more easier to manage this thing. But there's also an, a component there that has to do with, uh, with, 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 you know, mental well-being, with being ready to go back to work, you know, with things that are uh, beyond just core, core health care uh, and safety, right, that, that are addressed uh, in, in that, uh, in that uh, regard. So uh, to Olivia, I was very fascinated by the work that Olivia is doing uh, with emotive and and beyond, and really thinking about also with the settings that are sometimes employer settings, and love to hear from you a little bit about your your approach, and then you know how it's related to uh, coming back to to work. Absolutely, I think what is fascinating with the current crisis is for a lot of people who are working from home, but people working in general, even pre-crisis, uh, the tools in order to assess their well-being and some of the mental health issues, stress, anxiety, are very rudimentary. And uh, here's a question to everyone. Would you trust someone to, pro to provide you a diagnosis of COVID-19 without a blood analysis? And without the blood analysis, the diagnosis would not be complete. So all we have at the moment in order to assess whether people are stressed and anxious are peripheral measures of the central nervous system except that this is what we're doing in our company. We've created not only the hardware, but uh, the algorithms that allow to measure in real time stress and distraction, for example, and for it to be measured by actually uh, the, the hardware I'm using now, earbuds, uh, intraauricular EEG, so electroencephalography, which is a neurotechnology that measures actually what is happening in people's brains. And the, the fact is, this is not a medical approach. This is a way to personalize the day of work, to be able to assess when people are stressed, when people are distracted, and then to adapt and to tailor the day of work. And I think that's the key uh, because there are two main issues, maybe three. Um, first, we don't 
have the right tools spread everywhere in order to properly assess anxiety and stress. It's based on surveys and polls who are really limited tools. Second, there is always a huge gap between what people report and what they experience. And we're, we've been able to measure that gap. And the third, the, the, the third issue is the stigma around reporting stress and anxiety in life in general, but also in the workplace. So how can we uh, use evidence-informed strategies in order not only to better understand people, to tell uh, their work environment, being, being it in the office or in their homes, and also help them embrace and the employers and the employees provide safe, ethical and inclusive solutions for people to be free to report that they're anxious, that they are stressed, because it's a win-win one accepts that and on a scientific and human basis. Absolutely. And thank you for uh, for the effort talking about technology. I mean, David has been with us to figure out multiple technology hacks to make sure that we are able to convene and do this amazing thing. Olivier is actually joining us from France. Uh, from my car, France. because the technology in France at the moment prevents exactly. me from connecting from home. I live in a valley. I had to drive away from the valley in order <laughs> to find some 4G. So I'm sorry for the very uncool backdrop. No, the opposite. I think it's a super cool backdrop. And I really beautiful. appreciate the effort. Well, see, like we actually, the previous panel, we had to bring Vanessa Candace into the panel with like a with like a FaceTime into this technology so we can actually get the thing work, but it works. I mean, this is the, this is why I love technology. And I always like, you know, the engineering side of the equation, but I love even more the problem solving because technology is just a tool at the end of the day. We're trying to really solve uh, human need, right? And, and we're very good in like figuring out as we're building the technology and perfecting it, because it's never perfect at the very beginning, how to augment it in a way that allows us to convene and to share these amazing ideas. So thank you, Olivier. And really technology, affords, technology affords innovation and creativity. You wouldn't have Vivaldi without the violin. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Thank you for that. And uh, to the flip side of the equation, so, you know, David here is an executive uh, in, a, in a large company and, and we need everybody to come to work and, the, and the, you know, stress and, and uh, the, the, the notion of mental well-being is so important for that. We had a whole panel talking about mental health and well-being in a, in a world of distancing. Uh, but I want to go to Nina because Nina has also heads a center at Stanford that really focuses on executives, that right? focuses on uh, high-performing individuals and executives. Uh, that we need to bring back, you know, after this like time that everything was a little bit diffused, right? And everybody's a little bit kind of like dissolved and doing their own things as they're doing it. And in particular, in the vantage point of uh, managers and executives going back to work, Nina, tell us a little bit about your thoughts about around uh, particularly bringing back to work the manager, the executive, and how we need to think about that. Yeah. It's a great question, Ron, and, and really thank you for in this entire conference for highlighting mental health so much. Um, I think that when we think about, so there are two different hats I wear and I'll present it from those different perspectives. The first is I'm a clinician and I treat patients both at Stanford and in my concierge private practice, which is focused specifically on executives and entrepreneurs. And then the second is I run a Stanford's mental health innovation lab. So first on the clinical side, I think there are three main things that I'm seeing in definitely in executives and entrepreneurs and even more broadly, um, it's demand, culture, and pathology. And all of these have changed very dramatically in the last two months. So first, when we think about demand, basically what's happening now is we are entering a second pandemic that is all around mental health. And what's scary is that while for on the you know infectious disease side of things, um, we, we've had the peak and we expect that to continue, but be on the decline, the mental health side is the other way around, that actually now, things are just starting, and we expect it to ex expand and increase significantly over the next few years. I'll just give you a little historical data that when we look at the Great Depression, it turns out that suicide rates actually peaked three years after Black Tuesday. So you know, in a case like that, you have this huge insult and then multiple kind of subsequent things that happen. But what this really shows is that there is this kind of trickle down effect, right? And mental health is where that happens. It's like maybe first you lose your job or you're, and you're furloughed or then, or then, you know, maybe you're a restaurateur and now you can't, you, you can't go into your business or you have to 
do delivery instead. And so, and, and then you end up not being able to pay mortgage and then you end up having relationship issues. And so all these things really, it, it's both short term and long term thing that we're dealing with. So that the, knowing that that pandemic is there, I think is the first most important thing. But then the second sure. thing is that for all of us, including the executives and entrepreneurs, but for all of us in the healthcare community to recognize that the advantage here is that unlike with COVID, where we weren't sure exactly what was going on at the beginning, we know now what to expect. So I think that's really important. And so where we come in there is the pathology. We're seeing different pathologies and specific pathologies rising. And that is huge anxiety and trauma. We basically have this national response to trauma, a national collective experience to trauma that we're all having. Increases in depression and suicide ideation and increases in substance use and something really, really difficult, child abuse and domestic violence. And I know Nancy Loveland talks very beautifully about that with Crisis Text Line. Her company's done an amazing job addressing a lot of that. Um, now, I think where the silver lining is here, while it is scary that we have all this ahead, is that the culture change has been transformative in the last two months. And I'm hearing a lot of people say that when you think about something like the two months we've gone through, what we're really seeing is acceleration in certain things, things that probably were going to happen in the future, but maybe like three or five years from now, we're now seeing happen over the course of two months. And in psychiatry, what that means is stigma. There's been a huge culture change where now, like when I look at the New York Times, every day the New York Times has one, like some article on the front page of the website talking about anxiety or trauma or some element of mental health. And so I think that people are now willing to talk about the fact that struggling in some way with their mental health in a way that I did not see even six months ago. And that's huge for, you know, as a clinician, that's huge because once people start to be willing to say that they're struggling, then of course the next step is how do you get that help? Um, and I'm seeing that and why I really love working with executives in particular is not only do they have their own you know, set of struggles and everything that are unique, but as the heads of companies, they play a tremendously powerful role in being able to decide not only what happens to their companies, but what type of healthcare and their, their role models for all their employees and, for, and really for so many people in society, period. So I think executives play a really important role in um, being upfront about their struggles and talking about how that's affecting their business, their family, and their lives, um, and just their role of leaders in society today. Yep. Thank you. Thank you for that. That's uh, that's really really important. So, and and uh, another aspect that I want to to cover here uh, is is really this whole notion of the the risk going forward. So we, we this whole uh, new concept of Festi Health, which is learn, experience, and connect. Uh, is working on the possibilities, right? So we're talking a lot about what's possible to do with the new brave world of uh, virtual health and, and how it will transform our lives and, and make us make make us better off in so many areas. We we had a great panel with David before that that shows that it can get better health at the lower cost. Uh, we talked about it in the context of women's health. So with a lot of optimism there, but, and I, I was very excited to shave this morning because I can, I can start getting out of this quarantine state uh, but there are also risks associated with that, right? So we're not quite done yet, right? It's pretty clear from a science perspective that we're not quite done yet, right? So as much as we'd like to be out of this already, and we're all ready to be out of this thing, there's still some looming risks that are that are coming up that need to be managed, right? So it's, it's pretty clear from a scientific perspective and from learning from the pattern recognitions from pandemics in the past, right? So I'm um, back to Sudeb. Excited to have you here uh, as an infectious disease specialist from from Stanford, and I'd love to hear from you, particularly in the context of coming back to work, right? You know, Microsoft and David are creating solutions that enable to manage this whole process. But from an infectious disease specialist perspective, and David, maybe you can complement it after because you are you are too. You know, what are the things that we need to take into account? As we are, you know, spring is here, summer is here, feeling better. Like, how do we manage this transition so we don't go back to being worse off than we were before? Yeah, Ron, it's a it's a great question, um, and thank you again for organizing this and for having us, and and specifically for. Um, you know, focusing on a lot of the salient issues and being very forward thinking about this situation because a lot of people are asking what's next. And I think conferences like this are very important just to address that very question. So 
you know, I, I wear several hats, um, like many of the other folks on, on the panel. I'm an infectious disease physician and professor at Stanford. Um, I'm also a medical director at uh, an infectious disease diagnostic startup here in the Bay Area. So, uh, and, and I'm an epidemiologist and virologist, and my graduate work was in, was in that area, primarily in HIV, now expanded other viruses. So I guess through the various lenses, I would view the risks. We can talk about it in a few different ways. The first is what we know. And what we know at this point is primarily anecdotal based on prior viruses that are quite similar. What we know is that it is a respiratory virus like other coronaviruses and other respiratory seasonal viruses. Droplet transmission, six feet, um, and, and we sort of know that there are some suggestions of airborne transmission as well. We know how to protect ourselves from this virus. And we also know, based on what happened with distancing measures in many parts of the country, including California, which was one of the earliest states to enact distancing and, and one of the earliest states to enable um, widespread testing in the most endemic uh, or hardest hit areas, was that the distancing really had an effect. And we saw a rapid decline in cases uh, when we only enacted distancing in six or seven days before other parts of the country. So we know that distancing works and we know that primarily how the virus is transmitted. What we don't know, but what we have some various um, evidence for based on prior pandemics, is that there almost always is a second wave in these kinds of situations. Uh, because of the transmissibility, because it's a seasonal virus, and because other viruses such as the 1918 influenza pandemic have shown us that the second wave uh, is very much an in, uh, ingrained feature of these kinds uh, of viruses, that it's absolutely uh, 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 it's, it's absolutely uh, true that it will happen uh, probably in the fall, uh, and we don't know what to, degree to which that second wave will be relative to the first, but we do know that at that time we'll have some form of protective immunity in the population. We will have good data from trials, and we will have vaccines that uh, are, are well underway to being uh, developed and scaled up in, in large capacity. So that's what we expect. The things we don't know are how bad... Um, uh, the disease will be the second time around and how um, these workplace measures, and I applaud the efforts of David and, and, and uh, Olivier, really to help us strategize about these things. We don't know how bad that's going to be and who's going to be the most impacted, because at that time, the risk groups are probably, pr probably going to be fairly different. We will have a substantial fraction of the, of the workforce working from home. That will probably be biased in favor uh, 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 of individuals who can work remotely and biased away from individuals who have jobs that they have to show up for. And we've seen that in many parts of the country, those uh, white collar and blue collar workers are primarily the ones that unfortunately were, were most devastated by this pandemic. And it highlights a lot of the disparities that we already knew existed in, in, in medical care. So in some ways, the return to work, I feel, will have to be staged uh, in ways that are equitable. And that will be the challenge, I think, in, in coming back to work. The risks, I think, uh, will, will uh, primarily be uh, uh, along those lines. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for that. And, and uh, back to back to David again. So with this lens in mind, which I'm sure that you guys are taking into account, you know, what, what are some, you know, when you're thinking about the solution, right? Build, building solutions, large scale solutions for companies that are going back to work to manage the flow of going back to work, how do we mitigate some of these risks? And maybe like we have like some anecdotes or some interesting things that you've been taking into account uh, that, that, are, that are helping manage this thing practically. Well, what's interesting is that the uh, types of work and the different workplaces are so different. Um, we think of it in terms of a building you go in, an office worker, but I mean, we're talking everything from schools uh, and even within schools, you know, that's, uh, there's a difference between K through 12 versus universities. Um, we're talking about, uh, you know, people who can actually do uh, a lot of stuff virtually. We're talking about sports and other types of entertainment where their entire livelihood is based on people gathering together. So it's such an, you know, as we've gotten into this deeper, we've realized that uh, some of these strategies need to be, actually all of them need to be customized. Uh, we have to understand what's doable and how can we uh, better understand uh, ways that we can promote social distancing and, and to do things in a safe manner, but at the same time, try to bring back the business and bring back the people uh, to the workplace. Um, so there's it's such a difficult challenge, and I think we're all learning as we're going along. None of us have a playbook. Uh, we, we are just 
you know, learning, just hearing what's going on, um, applying the best principles and, and trying to do what's best. We know that uh, every state is also moving things, you know, in, in a different manner, uh, which creates a lot of challenges in terms of how we can control certain factors. Uh, and so as we start thinking about this, we have to recognize that there will be folks, um, you know, who will be adherent to certain guidelines and, and non adherent So how do you, how do you address the human factor in that? Um, it's not just about putting in a technology or a policy. It's about understanding that uh, people will do what they want to do uh, and we can't enforce some of these rules. So, you know, we have to, you know, recognize that that's going to happen and then um, put, put in sort of safeguards to make sure that we have a, a plan in case things don't really go the way that we expect them to. Yeah. And as we're learning through this uh, session itself, you know, there, there are ways to put the right kind of infrastructure in place and get 80% there, at least at the beginning, yeah. until because right? they, they will, any product that you build, I mean, for the, uh, there's a lot of product people in, in this room, right? So, you know, we build product, especially the novo, there'll be things that you will learn as you build, right? And, and as you get to the 80% solution, you know, sometimes we have to have Olivier driving for, you know, 20 miles to uh, talk with us in the car so we can actually convene globally here and here's insight. So I'm, I'm turning it on to you uh, and, and talk about practicalities. And well, let's talk globally because you also have a, a very strong global perspective for these things. You know, like uh, you know, from the hats that you that you wore before. Uh, David talked about variability, right? He talked about variability in kinds of businesses and types of works. We also talk about variability in terms of like the the, the global ecosystem. And we have to think about Festi Health. Is it's a, it's a really global mm -hmm. conference. We have people now actually watching this conference from all over the world. I mean, again, in a super short period of time, we reach thousands of people. There's more than a thousand people right now registered and watching what, you know, what we're doing here, which is amazing, which is that started publicizing it a week ago, right? So not even that, right? So, uh, you know, imagine the, the opportunity that we have in terms of reach once we start mm -hmm. scaling this thing up. And, but also the, the, the challenges, because different places around the world behave a little bit differently, right? And we've learned that, right? There are different climates, there, there are different cultures, uh, there right. are different infrastructure, right? Dif well, different brand, right? Different infrastructure, different levels of access to Wi-Fi. Even Peter Yellowlis, who, Dr. Peter Yellowlis, who is uh, who's a wonderful, uh, he's, a, he's a psychiatrist up from UC Davis, and I had the, the really amazing pleasure to uh, to bring him to another panel that I, that I ran before, and he was the head of the American Telemedicine Association years ago. So he was very visionary when it came to uh, to telemedicine way before it became, you know, ubiquitous like it is now. Uh, you know, look at the, the, there are technical challenges sometimes to bring even people who are really sophisticated into these things. So what, talk with a little bit about uh, global uh, opportunities and challenges in uh, virtualizing healthcare, particularly in the context of going back to work. Sure. Listen, let's let's look at one thing that is important. Until we find a vaccine, the only way to slow down the spread of a virus is through changing behaviors. Now, here is a question for you. In your organization, public and private, how many behavioral scientists are part of a task force that are supposed to manage the crisis? The answer is it's very unlikely that one would find behavioral and brain scientists. Um, would you try to manage uh, such a crisis without an epidemiologist? No, because you need the skill. But changing behaviors without experts in behavior change doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. and, and this is something that not only requires a beautiful speech or an intent, but it also requires data and data on the variability of behaviors, of how people process information. And this is why we've launched something called Brains versus Virus, which is the largest brain data collection to date in history. Uh, we are lucky enough to have a community at Emotive of more than 100,000 people owning one of our brain scans in 120 countries. We have the largest and most diverse, and that's the most important part, database of brain data in the world. Because some recent studies have shown that People like me, when I was in academia conducting research on brain activity, most of our research was conducted on uh, Caucasian males from Western Europe and North America for almost 80% of a brain data collected. Most of these males being students 
in cognitive science, psychology, or neuroscience. How representative is that? I think the, the reason the reason I, I, I left the, the World Economic Forum and the fantastic job and team, including Vanessa, that I was working with to join Emotive is because for the first time, not only as a scientist, but just as a person, I had access to the diversity of brain data, to the fact that there are some invariants in the way we process some very simple kind of information, but things can change dramatically from one country to another, from one city to another. Things that we consider as automatic as the perception of visual illusion can change whether you grew up in a city or in a non-urban environment. So imagine when it comes to handling the virus, the fact that there is no one size fits all, as David mentioned, we need not only to develop uh, brain behavioral and brain strategies or strategies that are informed by behavioral and brain sciences, in addition to all the other sciences and, and, and medical sciences, but also to think about the pace, the rhythm. When do you need to intervene? When do you need to change your incentives? It's just like offering flour. My friend Ron, if I offer you flowers every day, it's going to be so common, so banal, that after a week, you will no longer pay attention to my flowers. If I offer flowers or chocolate, uh, just on your birthday and for a special occasion, you're expected. But if I manage to bring you flowers at a moment you don't expect, it's going to strike a chord. And that will be an interesting thing to do because I'm more likely to grab your attention and to engage you. Behavior changes like that. It's like music. It's a matter of rhythm, of knowing when you do it. But in order to find that, you don't just need people who have studied psychology, behavioral sciences, and cognitive neuroscience. You need measures, real-time measures, which, to your point, technology affords for the first time. Yep, and, and data, like, we learned we learn through uh, the technology, the, the, the pandemic itself, uh, that uh, the importance of data. I mean, like, it's, it's finally, like, you know, I, I, we looked at something from the lens of uh, and we didn't have enough data, right? As it's coming through, and and we, but uh, we had a lot of people in the world looking at, uh, you know, at dashboards and at, at you know data trajectories and stuff like that. And finally, the conversation, at least the, the popular conversation, uh, went away from uh, you know being just qualitative uh, to trying to be more quantitative. Uh, and you know that has its own issues, of course. Uh, depends on how you look at it, but you know the the idea of using data and science to really manage. Uh, some of these things is, is is central. It's absolutely central to to what we're doing on the, on the mental health side, the brain side of the equation, but also solutions that are effectively uh, working uh, to do that. And uh, I just want to make to make sure that we're getting to everybody else uh, in the panel as well. But I I, uh, I saw that uh, uh, Sudev wanted to say something quickly, and I want to go to Nina to ask her a quick question. But I, I interrupted you, Sudev. Go ahead. Oh no 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 problem, Ron. And and just to echo and add to what Olivier so eloquently put, um, and, and it's a thought about seizing this moment. Um, it's from my perspective as an epidemiologist about this public health moment um, in, in society right now. So it's sure. flattening the curve. Because as epidemiologists, we talk, talk about epidemic curves all the time and the peaks and the ways to manipulate or modify these curves in order to influence transmission events and ultimately pandemics. We talk about that all the time. Uh, but it, it's certainly a concept that um, uh, it's fairly easy to understand, but I never once thought it would be a term that is glamorized, advertised, tweeted about, and that society would embrace, frankly. And so all of a sudden, epidemiology has become sexy. Everyone is talking about PPE, and um, uh, you know Tony Fauci has been thrust into the limelight as the doctor of the nation, and that's despite the fact that he's led that institute at NIH since 1984. So, um, right. as an epidemiologist, you know I'm encouraged that these have come to the forefront of national dialogue, uh, sure. and, and that this this is the moment where public health, um, backed by data, but understanding that uh, in the end it's simple concepts that society will embrace. Are, are, are the ones that we can take forward. And the other thing that I would say is that because of flattening the curve and because of distancing, we have seen clinically in the hospital declines in the rates of other infections that we've never seen before, unparalleled declines in the kinds of infections that's related to distancing and the fact that influenza and other respiratory viruses are now gone and the fact that people are washing their hands and staying home. So I think society has realized some of these advantages and distancing will become a part of our national practice every 
respiratory virus season, it's how to embrace that now. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for bringing that perspective as well. I appreciate that. And, and definitely Dr. Fauci, uh, idolizing Dr. Fauci and his amazing work during uh, this uh, pandemic. And then I don't know if you saw or missed uh, Missy Model's uh, song before mm -hmm. that. She actually made a song about Dr. Fauci and I'll happy to share mm -hmm. it after that. Nice. She was amazing. Uh, and, uh, and, and back to you, Nina. Uh, let, let's talk about uh, some practicalities, right? So data in the context of going back to work, uh, you know, from, from your vantage point. Yeah, absolutely. Well, so first of all, I, I just really, I love, so that I love what you said, and I think that it is really important for all of us just to recognize what an amazingly historic moment we are at right now. And, and that sense of responsibility that we have around 10 years, 20 years down the line, when we look back at this time, you know, will we have responded in the way that we're proud of and the way that will set our society everyone in our society, right? Like just to the point of equity. Um, so I just want to echo that before answering your question, Ron. Um, so, you know, the second hat I wear um, that I didn't talk about before was that I run Stanford's lab on mental health innovation. And there we research the field of mental health technologies and work with companies to build products and programs. And what's been amazing over the last few months is that um, there's been this huge increase in innovation, innovative ideas, and really thinking about how do we best leverage the amount, the data that we have to do new things. And this is from everyone from these like solo entrepreneurs and teaching classes at Stanford, where you have these, you know, 18, 19 year olds with these big ideas, all the way to the tech giants like Instagram, who want to really transform the way that they're, you know, hundreds of millions or billions of users are engaging with their with their platform and so um i think that everyone is thinking about what what does data give us and um you know what olivier's company is doing is so tremendous in terms of measuring things that historically we've never measured before right we as, as a psychiatrist when i ask people questions i ask them how are you feeling and they give me a subjective response and what we know is that we're not actually that great at assessing ourselves when it comes to that just like if you ask me what my blood sugar was i couldn't just guess and say you know i'm feeling like it's probably 120 or something right so so having that data and and just access to that is amazing so then the question becomes hey what are we going to do with it and i think there are three main things that i'm seeing as being really exciting and innovative with data and also on the, i think like these are also kind of like the ai ml side of what what's pretty exciting um and it really breaks down to diagnosis monitoring and treatment on the diagnosis side, thinking about how we can use this da data to diagnose much, much earlier and much better than we were before. So for example, things like using video to diagnose autism or using voice samples to diagnose psychosis like months earlier than a clinical interview would. Um, that's really exciting. Next is monitoring. So now that we're all remote, right? Like we can't go to the clinic in the way that we would before. And what's been really interesting is how people are using data and technology, not just in the outpatient setting where it's a little easier, but in in the emergency room, in the inpatient setting, in, on the mental health side, rehabs and groups like that. And so how can we monitor people when they're living in their home and not able to just go directly and give lab values? And so mm -hmm. one of the things I saw recently was a wristband that uses sweat to detect alcohol levels. And, you know, so it's not having to have that really expensive breathalyzer, but just, just as you have your Fitbit and you figure out how many steps you're walking, you can figure out something like that and then intervene in real time, right, before mm -hmm. things like that. Um, and then the final is at the end of the day, like we need to be able to democratize tre democratize treatment. We need to get it out to everyone. And I think that things like chatbots that are using AI to just really, you know, therapy and turn that into treatment from everyone from here in Palo Alto to Syrian refugees in, in you know, in camp in, in refugee camps. I think that um, people are thinking about data gives us enormous power. And how are we going to use that power to deliver good things to the world? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that you mentioned measuring understanding thing about yourself and, and you know, how do we know our blood glucose if we don't measure it? So, you know, we, we probably use, you know, this to continuously, and I don't have any issue with blood sugar. I'm just very interested to see how my blood sugar mm -hmm. yeah. uh, affects my energy wow. levels and my, 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 the right nutrition. And this is a continuous glucose monitor that I just started wearing recently to just, because I'm very curious about, uh, other implications that it has on, on actually my mental well-being as well, particularly yeah. doing, you know, changing the level of activity, interacting more with people. So I'm trying to correlate these to things that are not necessarily have to do with condition because I don't have diabetes, right? So uh, I, I think that this is, this is a huge opportunity for all of us to do something 
that that is in many ways will change the way we uh, understand who, who has conditions or has a propensity to do something, how to uh, optimize our lives. A lot of the work that we're doing in the Live Long and Flourish Club at Stanford is about life optimization. It's not about treating people when they're sick. It is actually 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 how to keep them healthy and to optimize and and their life at any given point in time. So I think that measuring on the brain, like Olivier mentioned, you know, measuring things that have to do with like our, our you know metrics that are ongoing, right, it will be critical to to our next generation of uh, managing health and well-being. And maybe we'll part in part from you, David, yeah. a little bit about the the work that you're doing. Uh, you know, going back to work, but uh, I know that you're doing a, a other very interesting project at, at Microsoft and you are focused on data. You know, one of the things that I know that uh, you're very passionate about from your past and your present is this whole notion of data management at a large scale. So maybe some some parting thoughts from you about it because uh, we're, we're uh, about to, to to go into the, another keynote in, in just a few minutes, but, but go ahead. Well, again, one of the things that this crisis has provided us is an opportunity to uh, not only accelerate the delivery and the development of a lot of these uh, great applications and solutions, but also uh, to think about the infrastructure that needs to be put in place to handle the broader uh, issues of how do you handle a, a pandemic. Um, and by putting in the infrastructure to do things such as capture information more seamlessly, move it uh, from platform to platform, allow us to be able to then have more interoperable uh, and, and open platforms, it, it allows us to be able to do things such as disease management. It allows us to be able to understand what the needs are, to be proactive. Uh, we've always wanted to try to do something like this, but there really wasn't the impetus to create that level of infrastructure and investment. We're now working closely with some major organizations to build that, and that's exciting. I think that's probably the one silver lining I'd say that I think this has uh, resulted the acceleration, but also the the need to invest in the infrastructure needed to, to create a digital platform. Yes, I, I think that this is, this is a wonderful way, wonderful way to summarize things. And, and also, uh, you're starting to see the common thread that they're going throughout the, the Festi Health. We know the Jeff Livingston, Dr. Livingston, that was before you talked about exactly interoperability, the notion of bringing all this data, you know, whether it's uh, the brain, data about your brain, you know, data about your glucose level, data, data about uh, your uh, psychology, data about other things that you're measuring into one place where we can actually put them together uh, and, and start understanding individual individuals in a, in a, in a deeper level. Uh, and, and I think that's a, that's, a, that's a really great opportunity for us. And we need a platform. We need the ability to, to actually do it in a way that is scalable, uh, extensible. We need to do it in a way that is safe and secure, right? This is very important, especially when you bring health data. Uh, from a lot of places, right? We need to think about uh, security and privacy because we need to have that in mind because when people trust these kind of things, they'll be more comfortable, you yeah. know, bringing their, their data into these places. So then we can actually manage this transition. When something like that happens, we have a place to go to and see the data and understand what's going on, look at things proactively rather than reactively. Like we're always in reactionary mode, right? Like, oh, let's, you know, when we talked about uh, COVID in, in January at Stanford, people said, yeah, it's a China problem, right? Like, it's fine. It's interesting. We're good. Thank you. Bye. Right. So, right. Open, secure, yeah. and scalable. And that's what and, we're looking and at. And also to be able to create work environments and environments that are adaptive, that adapt to how people feel to their states of mind, the, their bodies. Uh, uh, workstations that tell you, hey, you're a bit tired, we're going to engage some help, or you're too distracted as a surgeon or an airline controller, so we need to someone else to take your shift. This is already happening, and closed-loop adaptive work environments are the key. We really put the human back now that we can measure and use the data. Absolutely. So wonderful, wonderful panel. Thank you. S such a rich Thank panel. You. Thank really, you. really enjoyed it. Thank you, uh, David, Nina, Sudeb, Olivier, uh, for joining us.